Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada, streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Float, Odyssey, Telegram, Twitch, TikTok, and the Prepper Broadcast Network. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is November 19th, 2022, and this is episode 206 of the Workshop Podcast. Well, guys, I got a good one for you. Just finished up an interview with Jake from Ravenwood Acres. We'll jump into that in a minute. Real quick, we'll get the announcements out of the way. Number one, thank you guys so much for the growth of the Patch of the Month Club. You guys are a huge part of what is going to make the workshop a self-sustaining business that hopefully will be my largest source of income at some point. And I appreciate that. And that is because of value for value exchange, guys. Thank you. If you like what I put out and you like Velcro morale patches and you like to collect them or you like to put them on different things, you like humorous, politically incorrect kind of messages, well, go to patchofthemonth.co and sign up. 10 bucks a month, $100 a year. You get a patch every single month, plus you get put on a super secret email list that only patch members get on that give you first access to all kinds of different things as I release them throughout the year. So thank you guys. Number two, I get asked all the time, hey Tim, do you recommend this? Do you have a recommendation for that? And I'll gladly answer the questions, but if you're not sure or you just want to look through about 250 different products that I've used and abused, go by toolmantim.shop. You'll see all the different categories there. You got preparedness, you got emergency response, you have automotive, cordless tools, of course, a section for DeWalt, run by toolmantim.shop. Check it out. Anything you pick up there helps support the workshop. And finally, guys, got to remember our sponsor, FortressK9.com. My brother Joel has the Protection Dog Podcast. And the crazy thing is, you're like, well, I don't want to hear about dogs. Or maybe you do. I don't know. But Joel is way more than just one trick pony. He talks about, of course, how to train dogs, how to properly raise dogs. But he is inspirational as hell. He will give you a verbal beatdown in a good sense while he smiles and smokes a cigar. He has rebuilt, like a phoenix, uh, his life from the ashes. Unbelievable story. If you listen to Joel and you're not motivated, you don't have a heartbeat. So go by FortressK9.com, check him out, support my brother, and give him a follow, a listen, and check out everything he has to say. Finally, today's tool is a plain old box of rags. You might say, Tim, that's not very sexy, and you are right. First picked these up at uh, Costco a few years back, and now I can get them from Amazon, which is great. $14.44 for 75 lint-free rags. They're cheap enough that you don't mind wiping up oil and throwing them away, but they're durable enough that you can wash them multiple times, and they work great. Love using them for cleaning windows, but I just use them for absolutely everything. They're great to have around. Yes, do I cut up old clothes and keep them too? Yeah, but you know, it's like a crapshoot. You never know if it's going to actually absorb anything or just spread it around. That's what I love about this <laughs> box o rags. So check it out. Links in the description today. All right, guys. So like I said, just finished up a great conversation with Jake from Ravenwood Acres. We spend a lot of time talking about his, his military service and all the different trips that he took around the world. Very fascinating. The dude is a helicopter mechanic, so you know he knows his stuff. Talked about purchasing and building a homestead while traveling around the world, which was tough for him. Talked about his content creation journey. Talked about restoring old Coleman lanterns and stoves. I don't want to give away all of it, but boy, guys, it was like talking to an old friend. I've known Jake for a long time, and I finally had a chance to get him on the show. So with that, let's dive in to the interview that I did with Jake from Ravenwood Acres. Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I got a good one for you tonight. It's been a long time in the coming. I got Jake from Ravenwood Acres. He was gracious enough to reschedule for me because I was supposed to be in Dallas and that ended up falling through, which, you know, for better or for worse, it happened. But uh, Jake, you and I have chatted on and off for at least a couple of years now. And uh, yeah. I, I love to use these interviews as an excuse to finally have conversations with people. So <laughs> how are you, Jake? Oh, I'm doing great tonight. Where are you located? Uh, I'm in uh, southwest Washington State. So right here on the western half of the Cascades. So just uh, about, I don't know, about an hour south of Seattle. So. Nice. I've been 
weather been about where it should be this time of year? Uh, no, we're, we're looking, uh, we're quite a bit colder than normal here. Uh, we've had a kind of a weird year, but that's actually been pretty normal for the last few years. So up and down, do you, where you are, are you, do you, I, how far from the coast are you? Uh, well, yeah, that kind of depends. Uh, you got <laughs> the, uh, the Puget Sound here. So we get some weather that's kind of Puget Sound related. Um, and then um, to, to the actual, you know, Pacific Ocean, you're, you're looking at about an hour, hour and 15 minute drive, depending on where you're trying to go. So you get a little bit of humidity and that sort of thing, or is it? Yeah, I mean, not so much in the summer. We have tend to have dry, hot summers. Um, and then, but you know, your, your winters, spring and stuff are a lot of, a lot of rain. If those that have never been in the Pacific Northwest know that, uh, or don't know that it, it rains a lot here. Um, and then, you know, it's funny cause you have Mount Rainier, it's a, a sight to see, but there's, you know, a lot of people that will move here or get here during winter or spring or some time of year where it's, the weather's bad. And, um, and all of a sudden the sun will come out and it'll clear up and there's this, you know, 14, 15,000 foot beautiful mountain. And they're like, wow, where'd that come from? <laughs> so, uh, so, but it's also a volcano, so it's beautiful, but dangerous. It's like, so. Yeah. <laughs> must be female let's leave it at that so yeah exactly. <laughs> so you um yeah so i i first i i guess we must have crossed paths originally through the tsp community i'm guessing uh, yeah absolutely uh i think i don't know no, it wasn't before uh, it was before you'd interviewed with jack i think um, okay i don't remember you know because also yeah i follow, follow nicole too so i might have heard through you through nicole uh, Nicole sauce, those that don't know, you know, who that is, but, um, yeah, it's been a while. So I had you, cause I know I had you do a community member spotlight. Did, yeah. did were you part of the, uh, this is awful. I'll have to play remember here, but did I get you to do a tour view video that, that joint tour view thing quite a couple of years ago, or was it just the community? No, no just the community highlight. Okay. One. Right. Cool. So, so let's start i always love to kind of get people's backstory where you came from that sort of thing mm -hmm. but just tell me who jake is i always love to ask what your first job was for sure <laughs> and where, where you started and how ravenwood acres came about okay well um yeah so originally born pardon me um born in oregon and uh in a small rural town about 30 miles southeast of Portland. I'll just use that because most people know where Portland is, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we, we always roll our eyes when we say Portland. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I, it's it's wild because you can go from a, a city that has so many problems to the, the town I grew up was It's, it's um, right in the nest, you know, nestled right in the foothills of the Cascades. It was a logging town traditionally. Uh, not really that anymore, but um, uh, so... Um, you know, I guess my passion in life started with anything mechanical, I, you know, started with fixing my own bike to, uh, working on cars to my own cars. Um, and I think you mentioned first job, right? But, yeah, um, yeah. Always yeah. So my first job other than working for my dad, but, <laughs> um, <clears throat> was at a uh, lake resort. Uh, that was a really fun job actually, you know, as a campground, we rented fishing boats and whatnot. And, uh, it was a great summer job because it was, it was pretty much all high school students that worked there. So we had a lot of fun. So, but, um, uh, and then following high school, I ended up getting a job at a uh, garage door manufacturing plant, a pretty large manufacturing plant in Portland. Worked, started off as a helper, worked my way, way up basically as a journeyman mechanic and working on the machinery and stuff there. Uh, and about 2002, I decided that, um, I wanted to take a different path in life and join the U.S. Army. Pursued. Uh, so that was uh, real post nine eleven. Like very. Was yeah. It, did that play into your decision a little, perhaps, or do you it, it did? It did. Yeah, yeah. I was feeling that patriotic bug at the time, um, and it's something I'd almost done right after graduating high school, but uh, backpedaled on that a little bit, and then ended up just keeping working at the that manufacturing plant. And then, um, so yeah, uh, I, I pursued, uh, aviation. Uh, so my base job in the army is, uh, 
uh, helicopter mechanics, specifically the Blackhawk uh, UH-60 helicopter. Um, and I've been doing that now for 20 years. So, or a little yes, bit sir. Years, so, Yeah. And um, so, oh, yeah. what's that? Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Cut you off. Yeah. So, um, been all over the place. I've lived uh, in South Korea twice. Uh, family lived with me the first time. It was just our daughter and I. I uh, lived in Texas for about three years, um, Washington State, Nevada, back to Washington State, Korea, now back to Nevada. Of course, I've been all over the world for uh, what we like to call government-sponsored vacations um, <laughs> to different locations, some hostile, some not. Um, and the um, now back here at Ravenwood Acres, which we actually moved back here in 2016 from Nevada, after being there for three years and um, bought our first home on five acres. And we've always wanted to homestead and, uh, or just have a home on property for that matter and uh, be able to do, you know, our own garden and whatnot and opportunity presented itself. So we bought this place and we've been since then have been trying to develop it because it was other than it being a nice home on five acres, there was, there was no, there was nothing here. There wasn't one fruit tree. There wasn't any, there wasn't any rat. There was nothing that produced anything productive, you know? So, so we've been ever since that's where we've been at here. That's cool. So you, you came from Nevada previously. So does that mean yeah. you're stationed at area 51 where you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I got the scoop guys. We're all yeah. set. Now. Yeah. We're all set. Yeah. No, so, I heard a lot about it, but yeah, I uh, still haven't been there. So. You were, um, you said you grew up in a logging town. In, was it Oregon? Is that right? Yeah. Or, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you read, do you read any fiction at all? Did you ever read the 299 day series? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've read all of them. So, so the, the town, the, the, the protagonist, uh, is it Grant? Is that right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. The town that he grew up in was a logging town in that kind of in that general area, wasn't it? Uh, Forks, uh, Washington there. So, um, which is. Uh, also, the uh, the setting of uh, the wonderful TV sh or movie, uh, what is that? Uh, Twilight. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. So, okay. I, just as soon as you mentioned Logging Town, like that's like, yeah, I'm picturing yeah. 299 days. That, that's cool. Yeah. Right on. And um, so then, yeah, 9 11. And so you're, uh, <laughs> you work with helicopters or, or have been working with helicopters. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, so I learned something about these. Maybe you can talk a little bit about it. But I just assumed that if a helicopter stalled <laughs> in midair, that was that was it. But I watched a video with Neil deGrasse Tyson a little while ago that explained apparently that isn't necessarily the case. Is that right, or do you know? No, I mean, yes, obviously no. <laughs> you, you do what you, well, the lighter the helicopter, the better your odds are, right? But the smaller ones, uh, not as bad. It's called auto rotation, right? So say the engine's cut out uh the pilots put it into you know the proper attitude to hope and they can control the the rotor blade pitch you know which okay. basically um let me move my hand where you can see it so that's kind of like the wing on a on a plane right but that the blades that are spinning around just enough to where the wind as you're falling right keeps them spinning right um, it, it in essence, it's a controlled crash. Um, okay. Uh, with with the smaller ones, they usually can. I've seen training ones where they've done them, and the landing looked just as gentle as um, you know, if they were under power. Uh, however, <laughs> with the larger ones like the the Black Hawk, I've heard of plenty of people surviving them if, if they can land somewhere that's nice and clear and open, right? But unfortunately sometimes those places are not available and then the you know the odds of injury or you know death can go up from there so hypen says falling, falling from sky. Yeah, yeah 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 absolutely were, were you ever lucky enough to work with any uh canadians in the sea king helicopters by chance well you know it's funny you bring that up and uh what was it 20 26 no 2017 or 18 uh, when I was at JRTC, which is a joint training, uh, joint training readiness center in Louisiana, there, um, one of your, your aviation, 
uh, Air Force guys were with their helicopters. They didn't have the Sea Kings, but they had um, Air Force. Yeah, yeah, Ch- Chinooks and um, yep. uh, their, I think, links or whatever those are. I'll, I'll, I will note one though that your MREs are way better than US. <laughs> I've heard that. It's funny. My, yeah, Alice just mentioned to me last night that that's uh, my daughter. She she said, "Dad, we got to get back in and uh, eating the MREs again." She likes testing them out, you know. And we bought a case of twelve, the Canadian ones, and they were pretty good. So, wh- what was the difference? Why were they better? Just different? I, or? It seemed like more like real food. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's um, all right. You know, the US MREs, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of flavors or quote unquote menu choices, but it all kind of seems to taste the same. There, there seemed to be some difference there. All, you know, they had, of course, anyone that they're, they're different. So everyone's going to think they're better. Right. But uh, they had a bunch and they were just like, Hey, here, when they left us almost, a, I swear it was like a pallet full. People were taking them home and, like, you know, <laughs> So it was pretty funny. It, it, everyone, you know, a couple of the people are like, "Why do you guys are so crazy about these MREs?" We're like, oh. so, something different. Yeah. So you did you did quite a few tours overseas, hey? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I'd forgotten. I'd, I'd read a while ago, and then I was prepping for the show tonight, and I looked. I thought, so where all did you go? Are you, you know, feel free to talk oh, or yeah, not talk yeah. about anything. You know, it's it totally. Well, cool, but yeah, I did. I did a, the the typical. Um, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq tours, quite a few of those. In fact, like eight total. Wow. Um, but um, uh, I had a period of time where I was in the uh, special operations community, aviation side. And so our, our rotations were much shorter, usually 60 days or less. So that's okay. how I kind of added them up compared to like people doing 12 months at a time. Um, but I also got the fortunate side to go to um, uh a lot of places in the Pacific region because kind of joint base Lewis McCord here in, in Washington, that's kind of where they're centered, right? The, the whole Pacific region, Asia and stuff is their kind of the area of focus. So I've been to um, Cambodia, which was actually probably one of my favorite trips because um, it had been the first time U S forces had been there since Vietnam. So, uh, but just really cool culture. Things were really, really affordable. <laughs> so, um, it's a beautiful country too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was beautiful. It was very. There's parts of it that are so primitive that you know, like kind of what people would think, like they've seen on maybe a you know a History Channel or something, you know. But there's still that, still that. So, um, there's people that live, you know, in, in huts and things still wow. there. Um, and then Thailand, which is, uh, probably my second favorite. I've been there a couple of times. Um, I like Thai food, so <laughs> Thailand is the best place to get it, uh, and very welcoming, friendly culture there. And, um, Guam, of course, a couple of times, but that's a U.S. territory and, uh, Australia twice. I, I like, I like the Australian people. I'm not sure if I'm a huge fan of Australia. Maybe it's just, I haven't been to enough cool places but um it's really expensive there <laughs> but um, the whole island thing i, I assume yeah. seems like yeah. any 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 island nation or any island yeah. community tends to pay through the nose for things mm-hmm. right yeah yeah it's uh um and, and they're i i'm a big food guy I like foods and i like their traditional foods and i hope nobody here is offended by this <laughs> or anybody from australia but they try to emulate a lot of american style food and you know if you've been somewhere and you have your own food culture you're like this is not this is not right <laughs> like they had a lot of barbecue places and i'm like it wasn't a poor wasn't imitation good, or wasn't good compared to the barbecue i've had in the u.s so probably be like a chinese person coming to the u.s and eating yeah, american, american chinese food right <laughs> yeah absolutely like this is not chinese food <laughs> so so. And you you were in uh, recently Korea too? Yeah, so 15 months there. Uh, normally, it's about a 12-month if you go uh, unaccompanied, as they call it, like if you're married without your, okay. without your dependents. Um, you can choose to try to go accompanied, and, but you have, to, you have to spend there longer because, of course, it costs them more to send you there, ship your stuff there, then provide services for your family and whatnot. So... Um, but I did the extra three months to try to realign myself to get back to Washington state where my family's been here at Ravenwood acres. And, um, 
I had to basically, it told me, it was like, well, there's not anything available right now, but if you extend for about three months, we can get you back there. And I'm nice. like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, um, yes, which it was, um, uh, it was my second time there. It was my first, what we call duty assignment, uh, out of, out of my AIT, which is your advanced individual training that you go to after your basic training. And, um, <clears throat> uh was actually in the same unit which was kind of cool same company same unit and um uh it was pretty good it could have been better but you know the covid restrictions in sure, uh, sure. In, in korea were still pretty restrictive and uh so there there was a lot of things i wanted to do but i couldn't do a lot of the travel and stuff was fairly restricted so um but i got to work on some things while i was over there uh, worked on the, you know, my content creation a little bit. Uh, yeah. Built a website because I, I didn't have a family to come home to. to <laughs> I had a I had a little apartment basically to myself that I had to figure out something to do with my time. So I made the most of it. How far were you from the DMZ there? Is that right? Do you mil- yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, mileage wise, I don't know. I'm just south of Seoul. I, I was right. located... Uh, uh, most of U.S. troops now are, or U.S. military period is located quite a bit further south. Um, the the aviation unit I was in is, is actually located right just on the south side of uh, Seoul, which is um, in the um, uh, Seoul Air Base, which is yeah, an actual Korean air base. But we're kind of off on this little little postage stamp size. I mean, it's about half mile long, little small place. So. Was that leftover post Korean War? Was it or is that kind yeah, of yeah? Most mo- and surprisingly, most of the places are there. Like the first time I was there was Camp Stanley, which is um, most of those places didn't make much sense strategically. <laughs> they were actually just when the sign, they were kind of that's where people were at, so they just stayed there um, okay. for a long time. Um, really interesting. Probably the most I think anyone would have. It was really enlightening, I guess, because uh, I, I I spent uh, a lot of time in, just because I, I I work on the helicopters, but the Blackhawk I actually get to fly in the back too as a as a crew chief. Nice. And um, so I get the aerial view of a lot of things in the world, and um, um, I blown away when I first got there the first time. Like there's still you know uh, trenches and fighting positions and things that are still maintained by the Korean army uh, uh, that you would, you wouldn't believe, uh, you know, it, it is a, a country ready to go to war at any moment. And uh, unfortunately, obviously sure. you know, that's something we want, but, um, but they are there, they're ready. And uh, it's something you'd never see in, in our countries, you know, in Canada or the United States, uh, we, no one's ever actually experienced that type of, lifestyle i think so it, it, it definitely put a lot of things in perspective for me uh early on in my army career so so you you said you guys have had ravenwood for about five years is that right yeah going uh, i think what was it august this year was six so okay so how how did that work is so it you guys are kind of attempting to homestead or building a homestead are you yeah yeah we are so um even in 2016 anyone that was in you know here in the u.s knows it the housing market was just starting to really kind of heat up. Uh, so that was pretty competitive. We, our, our main goal when we were moving back was we we wanted something with, I mean, even a half acre would have been okay with for us, but the more, the better, uh, you know, so we kept moving. We're quite a bit, I'm about a 40 mile, you know, one way. So about 80 miles round trip commute to my work. So uh, oh, I'm paying wow. the price, I'm paying the price, but, but it was worth it. And uh, so, I think it was like the third home we actually put an offer on that we we ended up getting so um but we're happy with it uh it's only drawbacks was as as i mentioned earlier is uh, other than like one little garden space they didn't have pretty much well i i guess i'll retract that they, 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 there was a uh pre-existing chicken coop <laughs> and a goat, a goat shed but no fencing no fruit trees, nothing of that nature. So everything since then we've we've put in. So you guys must. I'm. It's going to be pretty important to have a 
uh, you know, a strong relationship and a good partner to be able to take care of a lot of that while you're away, I can imagine. Yeah. So um, I'm <laughs> probably like a lot of people in this, this world, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, uh, you know, I kind of have my ways of doing things and <laughs> I have a hard time asking for help. Um, mm -hmm. kind of raised that way. I don't, I don't know. Um, so, or maybe it's just cause I'm particular about how I like things done, but <clears throat> Excuse me. The um, so that I, I definitely learned some lessons in that because as we're getting as I was trying to get ready to leave, there's a lot of things that I did that neither you know I have two teenage boys um, and daughter. Well, she's she's 21, so she's kind of doing her own thing. But um, um, the uh, <laughs> that really hadn't other than their basic chores hadn't done a lot of the things I've done around the property, but I'm getting ready to leave for what well, initially was planned for a, a year. <laughs> and then that ended up being a little bit longer. So it, it created some challenges for sure. Did you put together some like kind of standard operating procedures or anything like that for the kids and the wife or up, up front? I, I, I went through a few times I went through and, um, you know, showed my boys and the wife kind of things. But I learned quickly that like showing them once wasn't enough. Right. You know, yeah. um, um, cause they'd be like, I don't remember what you said. Um, but <laughs> so, that. my son's 25 and he does, yeah. he still does it. So. Yeah. Well, it, live streaming is your best friend when it comes to yeah. things like that sometimes. Right. I, I, I've literally had, you know, could we have a, you know, a, above ground pool that um heck i got from a friend that bought a house that didn't his wife didn't want it because she thought it was scary and i get it because they had little kids she wanted it gone it was in good shape but i don't know how many times i've <laughs> walked my wife through <laughs> through things while she's live streaming like no do this no do that and uh, technology has been our, our a good friend in, in that in that incident so that's cool and of course you you're into preparedness like most of us Absolutely, yeah <laughs> so how how does that work you know how be, being away for a year and a half and yeah like how do you how do you how do you prep while you're away how do you make sure your family's prepped while you're away you know um i, I and i guess you got to look at it two different ways but how did that work for you well um so our our, our preparedness journey you know kind of started like a lot of other people's in like about 2008 uh when things got pretty tough uh, around <laughs> yep. the world uh i did have some you know we did have a y2k party uh you know we were actually up in my hometown up in the the mountains where we like to go and bonfire because we thought we'd be able to watch the city and everything go i don't know what we thought but um I get it. Uh, anyways we had a good time and um but so my wife's always supported uh, this stuff. She may not be as involved in it as I am, but she definitely um, is concerned about some of the, the world's uh, ways to, to know that it's important. However, there's a lot of things that I do that um, they're not involved in. And that, that definitely, um, you know, you can have, like I like to say, you can have all the preps in the world, but if, uh, you know, if they don't know what they are, then they're worthless. And right. uh, so uh, creating good, you know, action plans uh, and actually running your family through them or, you know, no matter who it is, you know, your people living with you, whatnot um, is is crucial. As I mentioned, I went through a few things like, you know, you know, we got a generator, but like here, you know, show my boys, like here's the generator, here's the steps, you know, here, start it, let them start it, let them get it running, let it get it hooked up. They're like, cool. Three months later, be like, hey, the power's out. I'm like, well, you know how to run the generator. No, I don't, dad. <laughs> so, I get it. Yeah, it's <laughs> tough. So um, that led me to creating some videos. Um, and I know you and I kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, and so when I was home, one of my times on from Korea, uh, I went through and just pretty rudimentary videos cause I was in a hurry, um, 
filmed like starting the step by step, even though the generator does have step one, step two. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, starting the generator, uh, winterizing, how to put the, you know, where all the the faucet covers are at, and those type of right. things. Um, where they're located, um, are because you were on a well. Um, if they have a water problem, I labeled the valves, like shut this, you know, loud valve number one or whatever, shut this off, you know, do this, do that. Um, <clears throat> just step by step. I, you know, I, I want to actually build, you know, a better library of those because, you know, you never know when you're going to be out of town and you could even share them with, you know, for us in the future when all our kids are off being adults someday, um, you know, you might have someone home, you know, house sitting for you and you can be like, here, here's a video library of stuff. You know, if you're going to be gone for two weeks, they know how to how to operate your how your pump house works or whatnot. So, where did you store those? Was it like a private YouTube playlist? Yeah, I, I just I went ahead and used YouTube and then just made them uh, private and then uh, or yeah unlisted unlisted and, yeah. unlisted and then you just share the link to them and then they have it and then they can access it any any time. Of course, that's um, based off of having you know, internet and things working you've of course could create you know hard copies you know that were downloaded to a computer or something like that so that's a great idea i love that and and the cool thing is you know it works whether you're going to be in korea for 18 months or you're going to be mm -hmm. away you know you work in the oil patch and you're away for a week up north and the power goes out and your family needs the generator as well it worked yeah, yeah it, it makes your life better no matter you know how long or how short you're away yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of people that, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, depending on their profession, you know, they might leave for leave on Monday morning and then not be back until Friday while they're gone all week and their family's there. So definitely. It, it, could, it could be a simple, I mean, this is, you know, you don't want to be morbid, but I mean, maybe, maybe you fell off a ladder and you're, you're out flat at the, in the hospital, you know, and yeah. it's pretty hard. You might be, uh, you know, hopped up on morphine or Demerol or something and, your wife needs to know how to start the power, you know, right? So that's cool. Uh, Chris Dixon wanted to know what uh, uh, what gardening zone are you in? Uh, I think we're like 7A or 7B, depending on what, what one you look at, um, which works to our benefit. You know, pretty temperate climate here, honestly. Although you wouldn't know it right now. It's like 23 out. <laughs> but I, like I know it's not compared to your cold, Tim, but that's all right. I, I, I'm, I got thick skin. I can handle it, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, Pipin says uh, my father used to leave work notes on his home answering machine. Th th oh. th those, yeah, I, that's actually yeah. not a bad idea either. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, the days the answer machines are gone, but you know, voicemail still works. So yeah, it does absolutely. So you were making uh, content while you were over overseas as well. How? Is there any, like, do you have to balance that? I can just imagine, because I, and, and not just being military, but anybody who's away for work and that sort of thing, is there any concerns about making content while you're working or while you're away, or as long as you're careful, not a big deal? Yeah, I, I, I think as long as you're careful. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I've always tried to avoid talking too much about what I do. Not that anything I do is like super, you know, squirrel super secret squirrel or anything it's just um i don't want to ever be scrutinized by that you know i, mm -hmm. I you know, like like most a lot of people depending on your job in the military i do hold a, a security clearance so I, I just you know be careful i don't try not to talk about what i'm doing because i don't want anybody to be like oh what you said was not okay and um there's of course always the um um you know they don't want you to express views that are sure. considered official uh views in the you know like this person's representing the u.s army and they're saying this thing and you don't uh, want to be a communist right yeah, <laughs> exactly so um but i i did kind of have to get creative because uh my channel has definitely gone kind of all over the place but um it's great though it is yeah. i love the stuff you do it's cool but but i did have to get a little creative and i'm like well i'm here in an apartment and i started in 2016 kind of moving towards a little more a little more towards the homesteading space and which is very competitive but i still was kind of transitioning that because of stuff i was doing um 
And uh, so I was like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Because <laughs> I'm I'm in I'm in a little apartment on the second floor of this nine story building. That, uh, so, you know, I made the best of it and uh, I, I felt like it did all right. Kept the kept the channel alive. So I loved I looked forward to your calm series. You did a how many yeah. was it a seven part series or was nine, it nine, nine, nine parts? Nine. Yeah, that that one I knew I could do. Right. Because uh, I am a I am a licensed ham radio operator um i participate my local community i'm in the aries which is their uh, uh amateur radio emergency services team i'm in actually a really active team which i'm glad to be back part of we're very involved in the local community we have uh probably one of the most supported teams at least in you know the any of the states that i know of or in, in, in our region um and um um but so I figured, well, this is something I can work on. I didn't want to do total ham stuff because the competition out there for the ham radio um, YouTube channels, there's guys out there that are 10, 20 times smarter than I am. So I'm like, I'll leave that to them. They've they've got the experts out there. I mean, these guys have been doing it for three times as long as I have. So give me an over, or, well, for those who, didn't see it or what, what was the, the the thrust or the overview of your your calm series that you did so my my whole goal there was to kind of just take a person because the the biggest thing is the entry entry into communications it is a part of emergency preparedness um but a lot of people don't want to um they don't want to get their license right they don't want to mm -hmm. deal with and and, and that's to each his own, right? I, I, I don't, I'm not one of those hams out there that are like, oh, well, you're just whatever. There's plenty of them out there, unfortunately, that are, I think they have a negative impact on the community. But um, so I tried to kind of build off of what we call in the military, a pace plan, primary alternate uh, contingency and emergency, right? Mm -hmm. Which you can use for that acronym for pretty much anything. But in communications, we use it as, you know, pardon me um your primary usually being you know something in the military of course would be just our our radios but um uh in the civilian sector right it'd probably be you know just your your cell phone right so sure. um <clears throat> and then kind of work from there to show people how to kind of build a plan the the key my key point was is it's the same as like people that talk about like bug out bags or mm -hmm. whatever. And they're like, Hey, this is the, the end all be all, which in my opinion is not, that's not true because everything should be built to your situation. Right. So assess your situation. What are your needs? What do you, what do you need? Um, and ultimately I would recommend if anyone is going to come and ask me like, Hey, what do you think I should use for emergency communications plan? other than, you know, like cell phones, right? If it's a two-way radio, I'm going to recommend GMRS, which is the, you know, general mobile radio service because it's unlicensed, it's licensed, but unlicensed because you just pay the fee and you, you have the license, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it's going to give you, okay, you're not going to get, you know, long range coverage out of it or anything like that. But if you're looking for some sort of alternate plan, to be able to talk to family, friends, whatever in your local area, it could work for you. Um, but yeah, that's, I kind of think that's where I'm at. But there, there's some new stuff out there. I, my last couple were about um, mesh-tastic uh, networks, oh, yeah. which, are, which are really cool and they offer a lot. They are though, um, you have to be a little bit more of a, you know, a geek to like want to get into them. I, I think there's, there's definitely a space there for someone that uh, wants to get in, gets the get the initial systems, put them in place, program them, get them all set up, and then sell them, kind of plug and play ready. Because it, we, I'm sure as you know, there's a lot of people that um, that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for something that's going to have a high learning curve. So right, I, I'm that way. I mean, I. Now, I, I do love to dive into certain things, but I would say seven times out of 10, if I want to do something, I would rather someone else, I would rather pay somebody 
to have done all the hard work for me so that I could jump into it. You know, yeah. it was like the boys there last, last fall or uh, last spring when they were all talking about the lightning network. I was like, yes, I understand. I really want to get yeah. into this, but I just don't have the mental capacity to spend time on it. You know, so they, they, kind of, they kind of dragged me kicking and screaming through it. And I'm glad they did, but that that's the way it is. Some, a lot of times it's just nice to have other experts that you can lean on and say, okay, you know, here, here's some, some time or some money or whatever to, to make it work for you, you know, or so that you can make it work for me. Yeah. Cause I think, I think all of us have, yeah, we have so much capacity, right? There's so many things that we're doing that you're like, okay, I'm just willing to pay somebody to do this for right. me. Right. You Cause I, I've got so much else going on. Um, it's not that I can't, I, same thing was like, I'm very mechanical. Um, I do most of all my work on work on my own vehicles, but there are certain things sometimes that I pay someone else to do because, you know, my time's worth money and yeah, I just, you know, I'm like, I just need this done. I need to be able to go drop it off while I do something else and go pick it up tomorrow or the next day or, you know, a couple hours later, whatever it is. And it's done. So, um, I've been working on, so every time I bring a ham guy on, I run this scenario by them. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll share it with you and you can tell me what you think. But my brother-in-law lives 10 miles from me. I have my ham license. He does not. Mm -hmm. It's, as far as elevation goes, we're, we're, we're equal. Like we're, we're level. There's no higher points between us, no trees between us. But, you know, any of those off the shelf Costco style radios and stuff, even though they say 35 miles, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what would you, any, any suggestions or if you had to build, um, so he, okay, this is what I'm looking for and I'm totally putting you on your spot, but I can handle anything on my end. doesn't matter. I can have as tall a tower as I want, you know, power technology, everything. But what I want on the other end is something dead friggin' simple. You know what I mean? Like just uh, pick up a radio, turn it on or, you know, something like that. What do you, to, to where they could just, he could, basically receive a message versus he couldn't transmit back, correct? Right? Yeah. Or, I mean, I know technically he can't transmit back because of, you know. Yeah. But well, I, I know at least in the in the US, right? It um in emergency situations, real world emergency and then could transmit technically, but um <laughs> there he is now. See? That's my brother in law calling him yeah. simple. So no, just trying to make it easy for him. So yeah. because he's really the only family member that's close enough. Their 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 house is 10 miles out. And if there ever was an emergency scenario or situation, it would be really nice to be able to communicate or have a plan put together for that, right? Yes. Boy, that's um I know, I know it's a tough one. <laughs> It is, uh, you know, so, but if you're, um, now I, I would tell you that there's the potential that the mesh tastic, uh, system that, would, would work that far because you're talking about being flat. Uh, the, the guy in Sweden that does, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He supposedly has gotten out to 150 miles. Now I, of course not, have not tried that. Um, <clears throat> but, you uh, need those are, they almost act like little miniature repeaters, don't they? Yeah, but he was, supposedly he did from point to point 150 miles, um, wow. which is is pretty wild to think of. But I don't know the conditions or what he's under, or what you know, and how that worked out. But um, 10 miles is still within, you know, line of sight. Uh, yes. Yeah. Radio. So, you know, obviously depending on the, the altitude of the antennas and whatnot. But um, you ultimately, like with like fifty watts of power um, and a decent antenna, you're you know even your what we call you know two meters. I'm just gonna say that obviously you know what I'm talking about. But, yeah. Um, as other people know about um, it should be able to reach. I think um, so. I because because I've. I know where I'm at. I'm a little bit elevated. I'm outside of a valley, but I'm only uh, just shy of 400 feet above sea level. Um, I spoke with a guy line of sight uh, with uh, a radio that's in my Jeep that's uh, 40 watts, and okay. he was he was over. He was like around 15, 13 miles from me, and that's 
trees and stuff in the way. Now he was lower in the valley, so it was there was no actual um, terrain in between us. There was obstructions like trees and things like that, but no actual like mount or hills or anything like that in the, in the way. So well, I think I'm it's right. yeah. possible. All right, I think you've encouraged me. I think I'm going to have to try it because <laughs> I've got a I got a I think it's a J pole made out of copper pipe that I used mm -hmm. to use to connect to my local repeater. So um, in it, I can get it up easily in a tree here about 40 feet off the ground. And I've got a, a mobile that I use as a base station, you know, and it's, I think it's got 50 watt power. And then I've got a couple of uh, UV, was it UV five hours? You know, the, the, yeah, that for a few years. Fans, yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking about, would, would there be any benefit to um, extending, like, say taking a bunch of coax and like throwing the antenna up over a tree, would that give you any extra benefit on their end or? Yeah, absolutely. You, you, um, I actually had, I think I bought them off eBay. Um, and you could extend it a little bit further. It's basically a J pole, um, uh, or based oh. off J pole theory. It's, but it's still, it's wire. It's, um, okay. I don't remember. You remember the old, um, TV antenna wire? Mm -hmm. It was like, two parallel wires and then the clear plastic in between, or, you know, some of them were colored plastic. Um, but it was just two copper wires running. It's built off of that. Um, but you could take that and put it up in a, a tree or on, on the side of a building or whatever and run the coax down. It has the ones I bought, I think have like a 10 foot coax on, but then you could extend that and then run it off of, I've ran mine off of handheld radios before and it dramatically improves the the range, of course. You know, antennas, right. the higher you get them, the better. I'll give it a shot. That's been I, – I've been I, – I think I've just been sitting on my ass for no reason other than just the fact that I haven't got around to trying it. But, yeah, I think we will. I, I, I've only got my basic – I want to get my advanced, which is your HF privileges up here. But Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm on general here – or uh, tech – technicians class or whatever here which is the basic and i i need to do the study and to get uh i can do some hf but i can't do most hf that most people do um so I if, if they offered it complete pre-covid there was zero online tra uh, online testing available so i had mm -hmm. to drive well over an hour to go get tested and the problem is is that the anyway the advanced course is just it's just a lot of rote memorization of things mm -hmm. I'm never, ever, ever going to touch at all. You know, I yeah, haven't. Even, yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying. Even for my test, there was a lot of stuff I, I memorized that I haven't used it. So. No, well, I, you know, I, I want to know the, I want to know how to hook up an antenna. I want to know mm -hmm. how to, you know, I want to know the proper, um, what's the word for it? Uh, you know, the proper way to communicate and, and to not break the law. That's all I need to know. Yeah. I don't need yeah, to know how the to test, build. But that's not the poll test. So. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't need, I don't need to know how to build a repeater from scratch. I don't even mm -hmm. want to know how to build a radio from scratch. I just want to be able to do HF contacts, you know, <laughs> I almost that's wish there's maybe a, an in-between, but that's either here nor there, you know? Yeah. So how did you, here's another one for you. How'd you get into Coleman stuff? Because if you guys check out, uh, yeah. Jake's yeah. channel, he has his, re so you're, you're, like you said, your channel's a bit all over the place in a good sense, but one of your niches is kind of vintage Coleman stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, I was, I was living, um, not long after I started the channel and I just moved into a new place and I actually had a nice, beautiful garage. And I was like, Oh man, I got, now I can do all these different types of videos and I just picked up this older Coleman and I grew up around Coleman's, you know, my dad had lots of them. You know, we did a lot of camping and hunting and things like that. We always had Coleman products. So they were nostalgic to me. Yeah. Um, and I'd found one at a, a thrift store and I was like, Oh, and it was really good shape. So I was like, you know what? And then I bought this, uh, this new dual fuel one, which they're, they're kind of the standard now. That's what they sell. And Ultimately, they're all kind of dual fuel, but that's you know. I'm talking about. But um, the so I I just thought well, you know what I'm just going to film this real quick, you know, just comparing the two because the quality difference is dramatic. <laughs> um, they're you know, a lot of plastic parts, uh, 
they don't use as much brass or copper or anything like that anymore. It's all, you know, metal, which we all know that the, um, is definitely more susceptible to rusting or corroding away. And so I just did a quick comparison video. I, I honestly, I didn't think anybody was going to watch it. And <laughs> It, it, it's still to this day the, the my number one watch video it, it's starting to die off but you know it's been out there for 10 years so um <clears throat> so i was like well shoot everyone likes this stuff i like coleman stuff so i started filming other things and because i have a mechanical background i was like you know i i get a lot of i was getting a lot of questions like hey i have this problem on some of my other videos you know how to fix it so i decided to create some videos about here, here's how I can fix some of the common problems with them. And, um, it's been really successful. Uh, they're honestly, they're, and I, I hate to say this like this, cause I know it's going to sound arrogant, but they're, no, they're really, sim they, they're really simple. Yeah. They operation, at least for me, right. I understand how they operate, um, and how to fix them. And, um, but there's plenty of people that don't. And, but I, I get, tons and tons of people that thank me for the content and save, you know, save them a lot of time and money and so on and so forth. So it's worth it. Uh, I, I enjoy sharing that with people and, um, uh, it's, it's been good for my channel. <laughs> so that, that too. what's your favorite, you have a few old pieces now, do you? What's that? Oh yeah. Um, I still yet to own, like, I, I want a Chrome one, uh, you know, cause they, they made those, but, uh, I, I, I definitely envy the people who live on the East Coast because I, I, I'm on um, a Coleman group on Facebook. Okay. Uh, Coleman Collect. And some of the shares they got, those guys, man, I'm like, man, what? Like, because around here, I'm lucky if I find stuff that's, uh, I tend to find a lot of the 200 series, uh, you know, 220 series, which are really common. Um, I, I can't say that I have a favorite. Uh, you know, I really like the one. I think I'm up to like 13 lanterns now. I have five or six heaters, um, one single burner stove, gas. I have propane one. Then I have several of the actual two burner style. I have, I, have, I, I probably should <laughs> downsize. They're taking up a lot of room, but um, I have quite a few. Um, were the they, older ones made better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they just the the bra being made out mostly brass is it makes a huge difference. Although the, the cool part is you see, uh, like if you know like the history of things, if they're old enough, there's a period of time where they weren't made out of brass, even though they were old because of World War II. So right, it's a, um, what did they substitute then? It was metal, steel. Okay, like, yeah. So like a like, you know a galvanized zinc plated or whatever steel the help prevent you know from rust and whatnot but ultimately if they weren't stored very well they 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 probably you know are not around today <laughs> so are they sought after by collectors a little more since they're probably a little rarer or not they can be um it's kind of hit and miss because it's really hard to tell versus i guess some collectible stuff it's hard to tell um like if something's been other than like, okay, this year, this model definitely didn't have brass, you know, parts on it. And also now it does. So somebody obviously replaced those parts. Um, it, it's kind of hard to tell, but if someone's done work to them, you know, like versus like maybe a classic car or something like that, where they're, they're looking at like, you know, imprinted numbers on the engine or other parts of it to where like, oh, this is not original. So but, so they would keep the same model, same design for quite a few years then, would they? Yeah, Coleman's definitely didn't, you know, they didn't change it up a whole lot. There's there's a few different types that they have out there that, um, um, yeah, like I said, definitely didn't, you know, their, their 220 series ran for forever and ever and ever. And uh, there's, there's different years and little variations to it, but... Um, they're still pretty much the same, same lantern uh, for the most part. And a lot of times <clears throat> people are like, I can't find a part to such and such. And if you look on the, the forums or whatever, you'll find out they're like, Hey, this part works on these six different model lanterns. So if you can find one for this, it's, it's going to be the same. The, the internal parts are the same. So they might have some different features or styling. But 
what's the most common uh, issue that you, that people have that you, you usually help them fix or that people can fix quite often? I, you know, and I, some people might get annoyed with my comments, but uh, <laughs> the gas generator. So, and they call it a gas generator. Okay. Um, it's, it's the little piece that goes up through the center. Uh, it's got a needle in it. It's got a, basically, it's a little valve and um, it, it goes in between. It's usually mounted and goes up into the air tube, which air tube is the piece that runs up to the top. And then you have your, your gas tubes that run down the bottom. And um, it, it tends to either it's damaged or uh, it's clogged or whatnot. Um, it, it's basically the most fragile part of the lantern. So therefore, if it's been stored improperly, um, dirty fuel has been run through it. Now, most they have pretty good screens in the bottom in the tank. So usually the dirty stuff doesn't make it up into um, into that area of the lantern. It shouldn't, but so that doesn't make it it. So, but that's that's usually like other uh, other than that, I'd say the number two thing would be usually like the valves will get seized they'll okay. you know on off they'll get gummed up because someone left fuel in them for you know a decade decades <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so um and so those sometimes i had one that i took apart and tried to soak i mean i soaked it in marvel mistral i did all kinds of things and i could never get that thing to like turn freely again so i just ended up replacing it uh, it, it 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 got so lacquered up in there that it was just it wasn't worth my time, I guess, to try to fix it. So, so some of them you can run off of like gasoline as well. Is that right? Or yeah, so what they call their dual fuel now, which is their, I don't know if they sell any that are even not, I don't pay a whole lot of attention. They're brand new ones, but um, <clears throat> they, they say dual fuel, they can run off unleaded gasoline. Of course, most people will tell you, Hey, run the non-ethanol if you can get it. Sure. Um, but that's hard to find of, that. Yeah, I, I'm fortunate. I can find it. My local community has a, um, a real big, like, classic car hot rod scene. There's quite a few car nice. shows and stuff in here. There's a gas station in downtown that sells it. It's expensive, especially right now. It's really expensive. Sure. <laughs> it's like six plus dollars a gallon. But wow, okay. Um, but it's but it's high octane too. So um, it's like you know, you know ninety ninety seven or something like that. But um, so they'll run off gasoline. I've ran mine off gasoline. It, it doesn't seem that my dual fuel one doesn't seem to problem. It. Uh, I've had plenty of people comment. And then it, there's a couple of the forms that I follow that people are like, yeah, I can run unleaded in, in any of mine. It, there's hmm. special like Coleman saying dual fuel. A lot of people say it's just kind of a marketing thing. Um, I try not to recommend that, you know, on, on my channel, just cause I don't want somebody I already, I already occasionally get the, you know, the safety police come after me. So, oh yeah. You know, like, Oh my gosh, you're going to die. You're going to kill everyone. <clears throat> I did a video on back feeding your generator. You can imagine the comments I got on that. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I, I did the refill in the propane. cylinder. Oh and, yeah. You're going to kill children and old people. Yeah. I old. had someone tell me that I should, I'm going to get sued and it's against the law and that, that they're going to send the law enforcement to come get me. And then I quoted the law to them and they, they never, of course, never responded, but it was basically tactically here in the U.S. If you do it, if you transport them thereafter, you could you could be held liable, um, but you're not. It's not illegal to refill them uh, as a person that's using them. Now, if you're right. refilling, trying to sell them, yes, absolutely. But so I've been doing now for almost ten years now, and uh, I haven't died yet. No, I'm still, you're, here. I'm still here, Tim. <laughs> so this might be a dumb question. I've always wondered this, but when you run off gasoline, does it stink, or like, can you cook with it, or do, is it just for lighting, or both? Well, they they sell. You're talking about the lanterns, right? Yeah, because I know they yeah. have white gas, right? That you can get. Is that? Yeah, with his, I think it's called Mantha or something like that. Yeah, technically, yeah, we call it Coleman fuel or yeah, white yeah. gas. Um. <clears throat> The they they also sell the ones that are the, the, the cook stoves that run they call them dual fuels that will run okay. off the unleaded and the lantern when I ran it off of uh, unleaded gasoline didn't um, no smell 
didn't smell any different to me than running it off of Coleman fuel or white gas. So okay. I off, I just wondered because I mean, gasoline in general just is, is kind of rank, you know, I, every time I spill it in my damn garage, I can smell it for a few days afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but not quite as, as diesel. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I was, just, I was curious, I've never done it. I should try it sometime. But yeah, that's cool. And, um, I was gonna ask you too. you recent I, so Jake does a lot of reviews on a lot of different things. And I, mm -hmm. he's introduced me to a few different products. But how is that you, you just picked up? Was it a 12 volt diesel heater as well? Yeah, you know, I, I've been watching. Uh, of course, I, I probably consume twice as much content as I actually create, but, um, uh, someone I've been following that's a, an Oregonian, uh, for years, um, he has a, like a conversion van that he built, you know, it was like an old shuttle van type thing. And he converted it into like a, a camper. Right. Mm -hmm. And he had one of those in there and I was like, you know, that is really cool. You know, and, and I just decided one day I wanted to get one cause my, my workshop, um, it's not fully insulated yet. I'm, I'm working on it, but uh, I, I usually either run a Mr. Buddy out there or sometimes it's just a little space heater or whatever, depending on how cold it is. And I was like, well, you know, one of these would be really great to test out. And then it'd also be, uh, I could, something I could use if I go camping or whatnot. And that's the cool part about them is they're relatively affordable. Uh, I think I paid a little over a hundred dollars for mine. And it, it's fully enclosed. It has a fuel tank. It has the burner assembly. It has a digital display. It hasn't even a remote. And I've been actually, it's running in my workshop right now because I'm just testing it. Um, and um, the digital remote actually works pretty good, surprisingly. Um, it's very Chinese. <laughs> but sure. it's, it's, oh, yeah, what, I what that. you to do if you talk about <laughs> is uh, they're Chinese clones. And I found a guy here recently talked about it that um, the Chinese um, there's a European version of these, and mm -hmm. they're they're like five hundred plus dollars. And there's a guy that told tore one completely apart, and he's like, honestly, they're 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 a clone. They're he's like, other than maybe some of the parts that they use not being as high quality, they're they're the same and in fact he'd had he had two he had one of the european models he had the chinese one he's like the european models broke down on me twice versus the wow. chinese working so I, I was like okay well it's worth the try uh because i figured i could use it for it's relatively portable right so it's something i can move around and use and it's not going to heat a huge workspace it's not designed for that I and mean, they're fairly small but uh um pretty cool little little device honestly is it going to heat a bigger area than a mr buddy um or is it about the same probably, i would say probably about the same you know maybe not like the the big buddy which is what is it supposed to heat like is it two to four hundred square feet or is it not okay that so it'll, it'll probably yeah. keep, keep up with it, that and then it you know it's actually pushing air because it's got a fan right uh, which is kind of nice because you know you can stand a ways away from it you don't have to stand right in front of it to get some direct heat from it and it uh, vents to the exterior as well right yeah absolutely like right now i just <laughs> I, I just took a couple of shelf brackets put it outside put a hole through the side of my workshop and it's outside uh because it has does have an exhaust pipe right you know for the but once it gets up and running you don't smell um any diesel fumes like you know maybe a diesel truck if you've been around like an older one especially idling oh, hate that you, yeah you don't you don't smell any of that uh in fact you can put your hand over the exhaust pipe you know and bring it over to you know your face and you're not going to once it gets up when it first okay. starts you smell it a little bit but once it gets up and running it burns really clean so my brother-in-law who was in here earlier they they have those old kind of torpedo style diesel heaters Mm -hmm. um and they use them in their calving barns and they're they're unvented of course and they're they're yeah they they have they definitely have a bit of an odor sometimes and i think the older they get the the less efficient they are so they, they don't burn as as smooth you know but i really like this new one have you done any testing on its power consumption at all yet so right now i have it i i, I intend on making a you know just a plug-in using one of the you know a 12 volt adapter 
Uh, but because I just kind of put it together real quick, I just got to run it off a deep cycle off my cam trailer that I keep, you know, I store inside during the winter, of course, because I don't want it to get ruined out in the, sitting out in the cam trailer. But um, <clears throat> it it seems like it barely uses any power. Um, I, I, I will definitely do some more detailed testing in the future to see kind of how much power consumption it is but it doesn't seem of course you have you know the consumption or the you know it doesn't sound like the fan actually gets runs any different so i don't know if the power consumption would go up when you turn the heat up you know the you, on the remote you go from i think it starts at three and goes to six okay um which is a little odd but it, <laughs> it's like i said the instructions are it's probably metric or are worthless because like they're, yeah. the Chinese, it's bad. I had to watch like several YouTube videos just to figure out how to get it all started up because I, I couldn't understand the instructions at all. <laughs> so You would think, I don't know. I, I, I have so much fun with those instructions sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes you get in, imported stuff and the instructions are like, ah, you know what? I can understand what they're saying. And then other times you're just like, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah, these ones aren't bad. I think if you have if you have troubles with it, like it, uh, you know, like it's not doing something you wanted, it's more like a troubleshooting guide than it is a user's manual. It seems Fair like enough. if you read through it, like even though it's still pretty bad translations, but you're like, this is more like a troubleshooting manual than it is a, a user's manual. Like here, here's how you set it up. Here's how you start it. You know, that type of thing. It's not, it's not in there. <laughs> so. But it's, you've been pretty happy with it so far? So far, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I was pretty impressed. But, yeah, the cool part is, like I said, you could take it. Uh, there's people I've seen that taking it, you know, they, a lot of people now have those rooftop tents on their, you know, their trucks or their cars yep. even. And there's a guy that built a rack that sits on his tire. This sits over his tire and it's got a little shelf. It almost looks like a, if you've ever seen those little, you can put them on there and it's a step. Just mm -hmm. your tire to step on. Maybe he just converted one of those and he sets the heater on that and he's got a long tube, goes up inside his tent and he's camping out in the winter and he's like, oh, I'm toasty in my, in my tent in the winter. So, And I'll bet you could probably pair it with a solar system if it doesn't use a ton of power. That, that's what I'm, uh, I'm thinking and, and even move it to some place. Yeah, like, you know, if you live in a, a part you know, especially some place that gets as cold as where you live um, and you're trying to keep livestock warm or something like that, you might even build a, you know, solar panel and a backup battery and you could keep the, you know, temperature above freezing in there. It probably wouldn't, depending on how large the space is, it's definitely not going to make it like a nice toasty, you know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but it keep it. Uh oh, oh, that's okay. Did I lose you? No, I can still hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I just lost my screen. Oh, oh there, there it goes. There go. Maybe <laughs> I kicked something in the cord, all of a sudden the screen went black. Um, but yeah, so now, so. yeah. So now that you're you're kind of stateside and home, what what's next for Jake and Ravenwood Acres and your content and your homestead and that kind of stuff? Well, yeah. So um, I just recently started the process of you know submitting my uh, what we call request to retire in the military. Um, because we get to a certain point and they call us in deaf, which means you have to ask to leave the army. Okay. <laughs> and um, so submitted that with the goal of retiring uh, late 2023, about December timeframe. I'll probably be out a little bit prior to that because my vacation time uh, that I have built up. Um, <clears throat> but Mili you know, those that are not familiar with the military or pensions or not, unless I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not some general or something. So um, I, I can't retire uh, for, you know, and just not work. Uh, I'll be starting a, another job of some sorts, um, at least for the next five to 10 years. But the whole goal is to get really kind of double down on our um, on our property, uh, increase our food security, which I mm -hmm. think is you know, amongst everybody's concerns right now with sure, where things sure. have been going over the last few years. Uh, we've been really focusing on perennial type production here on the property because because of the how often I'm, I'm away. Mm -hmm. um, perennial type stuff is definitely um, less maintenance intensive, right? Versus those annual crops that you have to be there during certain times of the year or just it's not going to work for you. 
we've um <clears throat> this next spring we're planning on getting pretty heavy back into annuals just because of I anticipate being around. Uh, we we sure, hope all, sure. all works as well in the world. No one does anything stupid in Europe. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, we, we've kind of doubled down. We we had, I'd, I'd mentioned in one of my videos a while ago about wanting to get goats to help me maintain vegetation on the property because I spend quite a bit of time um, keeping back some of the vegetation with, you know, weed whackers and whatnot. And I thought, you know, if I had goats, that would really help. I could put them to work instead of me doing that. And, um, well, we had some friends that were getting removed to Texas. And my wife calls me. She's like, hey, they have two goats and a lot of chickens. They want, or a lot of turkeys they just want to give us. And oh. I was like, well, we're not quite ready, but we could be ready. How long could they wait? So that was uh, recently. I, I put in a bunch, right after getting back from Korea, I put in a bunch of fencing. Uh, got that all set up and dealing with the challenges of owning goats. Anybody that's owned goats know that they're, they can be a challenge to keep within oh, their uh, confinements. Escape artists. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so they had, had a few escape problems. Got that solved right now. We'll see how long that lasts. And um, turkeys uh, sold a bunch, sold about half, uh, end up paying pretty much for the feed costs. The ones we're keeping have a yeah, few exactly. more that are allocated to friends. The rest are going to get harvested. They're not quite ready for Thanksgiving. Uh, they could, we could, but they'd be a little small. Um, so we'll probably do them maybe more towards Christmas. But anyways, um, yeah, the whole ultimate goal is just to keep keep at it here. Our content. Um, I'm trying to go back a little bit more towards the homesteading, um, and you know anything ultimately are is anything like preparedness related. You know, and and, and there's there's not a lot that's not preparedness related and depending on how you spend it, my opinion. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I've, I've got a lot of plans, uh, time I'm <laughs> short on, but, uh, a busy schedule. I'm sure just as you feel the, the pressure, you know, I have a long days. I usually, I usually get up at four 30 in the morning. I'm not home until, you know, six o'clock at night. So it, it's, it's tough to maintain that, uh, a homestead and a yeah you know, content creation that's what i'm looking forward to getting out of the military is because the military consumes a, a, a extreme amount of your time <laughs> so i'm looking forward to having a job that's a little more um traditional so anything anything you'd like to do or do you have your eye on anything in particular um well honestly um i, I have a lot of options but uh I, I am actually, I have, you know, gone to school for emergency management. Uh, like oh, yeah. wow. Um, however, I don't want to work for like a federal agency. Uh, I want to work for a local. Um, yeah, I get it. Part of partially because of the, the, the only federal one would be, you know, uh, like an hour and a half commute in one way. So I, I don't want to deal with that. Um, I could probably suck it up for a little bit if I had to, to make money, but I, I don't want to, because I have so many other options. I don't feel like that's necessary. I, I wouldn't mind working for state or lo actual local county level is really what I want to work at. Um, because I feel like that, that level is still connected to your local community. Uh, it's not getting orders from the white yeah. house. <laughs> so, yeah. And you can, yeah. 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 I, I just got, just mentioned to me the other day about being on the local emergency management committee and i that yeah. one of, i i'm i may not be a big lover of government period but if, if you had to if you had to have just one level of government i'm i'm i'm, I'm probably okay with local government yeah yeah and I, I live in a pretty small community i mean i think the county i live in the total total population around hundred fifty thousand. so okay um not not huge for the whole county so um <clears throat> So yeah, it's pretty small level. Um, I, I can of course always resort to the aviation side for work. Sure. Uh, I have regularly get job offers for that side just because mm -hmm. I know you know that are out. Um, or you know I do have a friend that's trying to he's trying to convince me to open up. He's a he's an HVAC guy and he has his uh, his own business in Oregon. Mm. He, he wants to expand in Washington. He wants basically me to head that up. It sounds great. I think the money would be good, but I also think it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> so I get uh, it. We're not getting any younger, right? That's mm -hmm. the problem. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
and, and his business is expanding really quick. Um, but of course, you know, I think it's his business also a little bit uh, based off of the housing market and whatnot. So we've seen seen where that's going. So feast or famine, and uh, mm -hmm. and that's the other thing too is you know it you know uh, being part of a growing business is great, but it's going to be a huge uh, tie in your time as well. Yeah. And yeah. you know if, if a fellow's trying to at least I don't know. 25% semi-retire, the last thing you want to do is be filling up all your available hours again, right? Yeah. And that, that's kind of our goal is ultimately, hopefully to get to where maybe I'm a hundred percent full-time for the next five to eight years. And then after that, find something where I'm either working for myself or just reducing hours because I, I am going to get a pension from the military. It won't be enough to live off, especially when I got still two teenage boys. Yeah. That, like to eat, you know, freezers for <laughs> a short amount of time. And <laughs> I get it. Um, but um, the, uh, you know, a, as they, they're, they're getting closer a few years out from going off and doing their own thing. So, and, um, and we get there then we might, I won't have to work as much. My wife works too. So um, we're, we're, we're sitting healthy. We just, you know, like anyone else, we want to maintain that, that, that lifestyle, at least for the time being. So. For sure. Yeah. Well, we've been, geez, we've been almost an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Week. I really appreciate it. So how, um, how do people find you? That That's the big thing. I want to make sure people know, I, obviously we know who you are, but where, where do they find <laughs> yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can check out our website, which is uh, the ravenwoodacres.com. They couldn't, couldn't get it without the in there because someone owns it and I didn't want to pay the price for it. So, but, uh, um, and then of course, YouTube is probably the, the next best place uh, Ravenwood Acres over there at YouTube. Uh, I do have Instagram, TikTok. I, I should do more there. I don't, uh, I have a little bit there. Of course I'm on Odyssey, MeWe, uh, even float, which we all know kind of where that's going, but kind of uh, sunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if you, if you go to the website, the ravenwoodacres.com, all the links and everything is in there and you can kind of follow along it. If, if you don't remember any of the other links there. So if anybody's watching on the replay, I pinned, jake's youtube channel here in the live chat but if you're listening in the audio i put all of your links in the description for the podcast so it'll all be there so people can find you for sure perfect so yeah any anything else we missed jake or you you covered no i think you know i think we've we covered it most it, uh, it's been great tim I yeah no, I, connecting. I, yeah so. i i said uh, um some of these interviews are a bit selfish on my part because i have people i consider friends and acquaintances that i've you know talked a little bit with offline or online as time goes on but these interviews are great because it gives us a chance to finally sit down and and yeah i don't know get to know each other a little bit i appreciate it and then share it with the community you know absolutely cool well i'd, I'd love to have you back sometime maybe we'll maybe do a deep dive in uh coleman gear sometime if you'd like Heck yeah yeah definitely that'd be fun maybe in the new year we'll we'll hook up again and get you back on sounds good tim Perfect. Thanks, Jacob. You can hang in the background for just a sec while I close up if you want, and I'll be right back with you. All right. Will do. Well, guys, I hope you liked that. I am so glad I finally got Jake on here, and I was thankful that he uh, was flexible enough to move things around, and we got him on this evening for a, a rare Saturday evening interview. So I hope you guys appreciated it and enjoyed it. I know I did. Learned a lot, and uh, it's just good talking to someone like-minded that has a uh, you know, common sense and some uh, just real, real good thoughts coming out from him. I love it. I love, love learning about the Coleman stuff and, and the diesel and just hearing everybody's stories. It always brings a smile to my face. So just want to thank Jake one more time for coming on and thank you guys for being here and uh, asking questions and sharing information. And as always, guys, stay happy, stay healthy and have a great week.